Okay, I think I consented. All right, so yeah, so uh, today we're glad to have uh, Dr. Harrison Chen from Academia Sinica. So the talk of the title of the talk is Categorical Delaying Allowance, a Coherent Spring Theory and the Categorical Traces. Please. Uh, thanks for inviting me to speak. Um, this is a joint work with David Benzvi, Tomlin Nadler. Uh, so I'd like to start out just by uh, giving a little bit of background on sort of local Langlands and the Lee Langlands in particular. So let me just sort of fix some notation. So F is going to be a local field. And uh, with residue characteristic uh, or residue field, uh, finite field with uh, Q elements. And uh, so let me just sort of give a very brief uh, statement of local Langland. So the uh, Langland says there's a surjection from the set, oh, and uh, so G is, so um, I'm gonna maybe do a, make my, okay, so if I don't do this, I'm going to, um, for the rest of the talk, forget to put checks where these need to be. So I'm gonna do a, a bad thing and put, or maybe an offensive thing and put the check on the automorphic side. So G check is going to be a, a reductive group. So, um, so, it, so the, the local Langlands conjecture uh, sort of conjectures a, a, a surjection from the set of smooth irreducible representations uh, of the group with coefficients in this, this uh, local field to some set, which I'll call Langlands parameters. Uh, and I'll just sort of skip a few steps and just identify these with they do lean uh, parameters. So these are going to be map, uh, group homomorphisms from, from the, the, the they group into, oh, I've already messed up, uh, in, in, into the Langland's dual group of this one. Uh, and the no cone element in the, sort of in the group uh, subject to the following conditions. So we want the for any uh, lift of the Frobenius to be semi simple. Uh, this thing should have uh, open kernel. Uh, it should have a, this, the inertia should, should, the image of the inertia should be finite. And maybe most importantly, as for me, uh, it should satisfy the following commuting relation. So the adjoint action of uh, the image of an element in here should act on the no potent by a power two. And this is all mod uh, sort of simultaneous punctuation. I've kind of run out of space, so uh, I'll get out here. Okay, so um, so this is a conjecture. Uh, I said it's a surjection, and I won't say too much about the, the, the fibers, but maybe I'll just sort of remark. So the fibers have something to do uh, with uh, component groups of stabilizers. But I won't really say more than that. Uh, okay, so um, there's a sub conjecture of this conjecture, now a theorem, or it's been a theorem for some time, which has to do with the sort of unipotent principle series. So, uh, so what we'll look at here are Irreducible representations, which are which contain an evil Hori fixed vector, so Hori, and this means contains an evil Hori fixed vector. And well, the conjecture says that this um, subset uh, should correspond under 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 local Langlands to some set which I'll call unipotent Langlands parameters. Uh, so what these are. Um, so I'm just going to impose the additional condition that uh, the, this this um, this this representation, when restricted to inertia, should be trivial. Um, I.e., so equivalently, if we just sort of choose a fixed lift of Frobenius, then uh, this, these are just semi-simple elements of the group plus no point elements of the group, subject to the commuting relation, subject to the following. Q commuting relation. 
So this is a theorem. It was it was proven by Kazan Lustig uh, in the 80s. And and well, the fibers, I won't say I'll, I'll suppress all remarks about the fibers. And I'd like to start out by just by sort of sketching the proof. Um, so, uh, so the so the main players here. So I'll just introduce them briefly. So we have the Springer resolution. So this is a no point cone. I'll put the G there, but I probably won't continue to write it. And we have the Springer resolution. So just on at the level of points, these are these are um, pairs of no point of a no point element and a flag such that the no point element fixes the flag. So, uh, okay, so this is the Springer resolution. Uh, we, can, uh, we can attach to the Springer resolution, the self private product of uh, the Springer resolution. So that's this is sort of write it here. So the Steinberg. And I'll just sort of, just so I, you know, for, for future use, I'm going to uh, say that this is a derived fiber product, and I think the fiber product is going to be alpha. These, these details I'm going to mostly suppress, but they're, they're necessary for um, the statements to work. And uh, the last thing I'd like to introduce is the affine type of category. Or if you like, maybe I'll call this the mixed version. So, so, so is, the, is yes. the derived product with the G different than the than if you did it with n. Uh yes, yes. And I somehow so somehow um, if we do it this way, you can sort of present it as a DG scheme, which is reasonably finite. But I think if you put an n here, and my guess is that it's that's no longer true. So you know, yeah. So somehow the nice thing about putting the g here is that g is smooth. Everything here is smooth. So this is a global fiber product of smooth things. So it's quasi smooth. It's sort of a derived version of what we put here intersection. Um, I've minimized the uh, video, so I, but uh, yeah, just you know, interrupt me. I, I can't really see anybody. Um, anyway, so the so the, the I'd like to sort of introduce this affine Hecke category, which is I'll just define in the following way. So this is going to be the category of G equivariant coherent sheaves on the Steinberg. So the derived Steinberg. Um, so I'll sort of make a sorry. Um, modify that. So I want G cross GM equivariant sheaves on the Steinberg. So this GM over here just acts by scaling the fibers of the Springer resolution or uh, you know uh, the fibers, i.e., to the projection uh, of the projection to the fiber, i.e. So I'll say a little bit more about why this deserves to be called an affine Hecke category in a minute. But for now, let me just sort of leave it here. Okay. So the the way the proof kind of goes is first, um, they the the, the authors above uh, Kazan and Lusik identify the growth indie group of this category. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of write category in. And I'll, you know, they, they don't use the drive scheme or whatever, but somehow the drive stuff's irrelevant for the group in the group. So I'll just sort of leave the same as is, and they identify with that by So um, maybe uh, a more modern perspective on this or a more recent perspective is due to Bezor Kamnikov. So like, why, why would this, why should this be true? Um, so there's a result by Bezor Kamnikov Which ident so um, this is which identifies the category of um, Eohori equivariant sheaves on the affine flag variety um, on the on the automorphic side. Uh, so there's a monoidal equivalence between this category and their convolution with um, this this mixed affine Hecke category, or rather the non-mixed version of this affine Hecke category above. Right. So somehow. This this category here, one might kind of expect. It might be more reasonable to start by calling this category 
an affine predicate category and going passing through this equivalence to somehow uh, you know identify it with with this sort of category of coherent she's on the spectral side. So the reason uh, I don't do anything like that is because um, well th there there's no GM action in this uh, equivalence. Uh, I mean I think it's a reasonable I think. Roman has conjectured that you can sort of put the GM in if you consider appropriate mixed sheets on the site, but it hasn't been written down, so it's not something we can use. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is to uh, pass through equivariant localization. So this is a technique that allows us to fix a central character. So I didn't say this, but the center uh, of the sort of the sapphire Hecke algebra is identified with the growth in D group of the representation ring of G cross GM. So um, in particular, a central character is just the same thing as a point or a semi-simple conjugacy class in G plus uh, sort of element, a sort of invertible element of the field. So for me, invertible complex number. Okay, so, uh, so what, what this buys us, so the statement here is that uh, what, so we take uh, this growth in D group, and if we specialize it over the center, so I'm just gonna call the center Z with uh, some character, then this thing is isomorphic to, oh, okay, well, I'll just sort of, let's call the SQ. Then th this, th this, this algebra is equivalent to the borel more homology of the sort of fixed points, uh, SQ fixed points of the Seinberg. So by sort of fixing a central character, we pass from K theory to borel more homology, and we replace the Seinberg with some, some fixed point variety. Um, right. So, I mean, in terms of classifying irreducibles, this is something you can do sort of one central character at a time. So it's like it's sort of a reasonable step. And then, uh, so furthermore, um, we can sort of use sort of the usual sheaf theory package, which allows us to identify this Borel more homology. So because somehow fixed points is going to commute with fiber products, this Borel more homology is equivalent. So the first step is somehow just by pushing around the junctions, this thing is equivalent to the self X of, I didn't name the Springer resolution, so I'll name it, it's mu. Um, so we have this fixed point version of mu, and we'll just push forward the constant sheet on the fixed point version of the Springer resolution. Uh, so this is self X. And then uh, sort of one can sort of ap apply DVD decomposition. So, uh, right, so somehow by DVD, this is um, isomorphic to a sum of, of sort of coefficient vector spaces, uh, let's say tensored with intersection cohomology sheaves with some shifts. And the point is, so uh, that these, these end up being the irreducibles of the affine Heck algebra, and these are some kind of character sheaf. Okay, so that's sort of a sketch of the idea of uh, the proof. So, um, so maybe, I'll move on to part two. Uh, so let me sort of keep statements of our results. So, uh, so our, our, the question we sort of want to address is how can we, how can we lift this, this sort of, um, uh, the sort of the wing Langlands to a, a sort of categorical statement to the categorical level? So there, there are some precedents for this. Uh, so. Precedence. 
in just sort of ordinary Springer theory, which um, you can kind of think about as the case here where we take SQ to be the identity in one. So uh, the, the sort of what we'll use are two facts. So one is sort of a numerical criterion. So some kind of numerical dimension count. So, which will kind of imply, so there's, so the dimension count tells us that the sort of for the Springer resolution, the, the, the Springer res resolution is semi-small, which will imply that the shifts are all zero, which in particular imply, implies that this um, sort of Springer sheaf is, is perverse. And uh, the second thing that this dimension count buys us is that uh, the category of G equivariant perverse sheaves on the no-pwn cone is semi-simple, i.e. every object is projective. So a formal consequence of these two uh, observations is that if we just take this sheaf, so I'll call it um, S, and we Look at the subcategory it generates inside of G equivariant perverse sheaves on the no-point cone. This thing is just equivalent to uh, modules for uh, its, its endomorphism algebra, i.e., representations of the loop. So this is the kind of statement that we're going to try to aim for. Uh, so let's just sort of go through these sort of two, if we sort of go through these two, okay. So this, the, the sort of, the, the shifts and perversity, uh, this uh, is not real, not, not an obstruction. If, if, we're, if we're willing to sort of work with derived categories. So if we work with derived categories, we, we don't have to worry about any of this at all. But there is another sort of more serious obstruction, uh, which is that uh, we we only have sort of this the sheaf theory after after fixing central character. So we we can only sort of make these kind of you know just we. Sort of a priori, we can only just we can only make these categorical statements one one uh, sort of uh, well one central character at a time. So obstruction to sort of this sort of affine statement. Okay, so uh, but maybe now is a good time to uh, at least. So what 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 we kind of want is we want to realize uh, the affine heck algebra as the endomorphisms, uh, so I should be a little careful, uh, as the derived endomorphisms of some kind of sheaf. So this is some kind of some kind of sheaf, which we'll call the coherent. Okay, so, so spoiler, it's going to be a coherent sheaf. So uh, it's some kind of coherent Springer sheaf. Um, on some, you know, some, some stack, which I'll just call LUG for now. And maybe now is a good time for me to state the main theorem. So the main theorem is in fact that there's, we, we do have a sort of analog of this Springer theory statement, this categorical Springer theory statement which is that the affine heck algebra, uh, or rather perfect, the derived category of perfect modules for it embeds into the category of coherent sheaves on some unipotent, uh, some stack of unipotent Langlands parameters. So we have a version for sort of fixed Q and we also have a version where we sort of allow um, sort of Q to vary. And uh, well, so I haven't defined what this uh, space is and I haven't defined what this sheath is, but 
uh, that full sort of one layer. Um, so, and these embeddings are compatible. So, uh, okay, um, maybe for this statement, I need Q to be not be not equal one. Uh, we have statements for Q equals Q equals one as well, but they're a little bit more involved. Uh, there, so these embeddings are compatible with parabolic induction. And they take the anti-spherical module um, or the, the sort of Whitaker uh, module to, to the structure sheet. And here we need to we require that Q is not a really good one. Okay. Um, so maybe before going on, um, I'll uh, sort of say a little bit about how this fits into some recent work uh, on sort of a categorical local Langland. So, so we view this as sort of a, this is categorical the lean Langlands, but there's also a sort of categorical local Langlands, which has attracted some interest lately. Um, so let me just sort of say how this fits in, how the story fits in. So um, this categorical like local Langlands, um, I'll sort of attribute it to various people. So Gatesbury, uh, Genistier, um, and Record, uh, Shinwen Zhu, and Clark Schulze. So there's some variations of it, but uh, I'll do my best. State everything. So, uh, okay. So on the on the spectral side, what we have is um, so what they do is they sort of uh, formulate what it means to be a, a Langlands parameter in families, and that sort of defines a moduli stack, which they show is actually a stack. So um, we have some moduli stack of Langlands parameters. And its points are exactly what you think they are. So the, the sort of complex points are, or its geometric points are exactly what you think they are, minus the sort of condition that the Fermidian is semi-simple. That's sort of uh, somehow needed in order to make it into uh, an, outbreak, sort of a, an outbreak variety. Um, so inside of here, we have a connected component. So the, the unipotent Langlands parameters forms the, the sort of identity component. And then, so uh, the, the sort of natural categorification of the spectral side is just coherent sheaves on this, on this stack. Uh, okay. And then on the automorphic side, things get a little bit more complicated. So the sort of naive guess doesn't, doesn't work. It's not going to, there's no chance for the naive guess, i.e. representations of the piatic group be equivalent to this category. Instead, one has to do something a little more complicated. So there's two, Kind of versions of this. So the first is to take the group and take Frobenius twisted equivariant, you know, form some kind of Frobenius equivariant uh, adjoint quotient. Sorry, Frobenius twisted adjoint quotient. And the other is to take Bun G on this far contained curve. I won't say too much about either of these, but inside of these, um, so here there's a closed orbit, which is the point mod GF. And inside here, there's an open orbit, uh, sort of given by the trivial bundle. And if we sort of feed both of these in to some category, if we take sheaves on, uh, elliptic sheaves on either of these, the conjecture is that these categories should be equivalent. Uh, so where our story fits in is first we take on this side, the category of coherent, we, we want to restrict to the identity component. So we only take unipotent parameters and then we further restrict to the sort of Springer part. And then on the automorphic side, when you sort of over here, you can either restrict to the close or you can restrict to the open, one gets representations of, or smooth representations of the group. Um, and then one can further restrict to this principal series, unipotent principal series and 
what our equivalence says is that you know, these are equivalent, or rather, it's, there's a fully faithful embedding over there. And so this is it's total. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about methods. Um, so our sort of main methods are uh, sort of clock homology. Oh, sorry, uh, I, I have a question. So uh, your theorem proved the last line, it's the uh, orange line is actually equivalence category? Yeah, I mean, tautologically, um, I mean, somehow, well, the theorem is that we have a fully faithful embedding from here to here, and then oh, okay. the central image. I'm just going to define this the Springer part. Oh, okay, all right, okay. Yeah, uh, I don't. I mean, I, I, I'm lying a little bit here too. I mean, it's not. Well, anyway, it's. Let me just sort of define it to be the central image. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Right, so methods, Hopf homology, and categorical cases. Well, let me just say Hopf homology for now. Okay, so let's just recall. Um, uh, so recall what we wanted uh, was a sheaf. So what we want is to sort of define a definition of this coherent Springer sheaf. Right, so ideally, one thing we should look for is, uh, well, okay, so the idea is to replace the growth in D group with Hochschild homology and then interpret Hochschild homology geometrically. So, um, uh, slash sheet theoretically. Okay, so um, so let me sort of first define Hux homology and say a little bit about why one might expect this to sort of Hux homology to give us both of these things. So here's the definition. Um, so let's let C be uh, a compactly generated co-complete DG category. Or if you like, you can just kind of think of derived categories or something. So that's sort of maybe my main example. So um, we'll define the dual uh, of C uh, to be uh, another category uh, equipped with um, a, a co-evaluation map and an evaluation map. So here, um, this tensor product, so that we, how, how do we define this tensor product? Uh, so C tensor D is defined to be, well, we just take C naught. Okay, so we, there's sort of a, a pointwise tensor product on the small objects, on the compact objects. Uh, so here, uh, and then we incomplete. So this is the definition where uh, so the objects of the pointwise pointwise fiber product are just the, 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 the it's just the product of the objects of the two and then the, the homs are given by the tensor of the homs. I'll just sort of write this and leave the details but okay so um, so a dual of a category is uh, another category equipped with these maps satisfying identities. So the Zorro identities. Uh, so I won't spell what they are, but sort of standard. And then given such a structure or given a, given a dual, we can define the Hofstra homology in the following way. So what we can do is we can first take the co-evaluation Then we can apply a functor. And then we apply the evaluation. 
and we just sort of evaluate the, this composition on the one dimensional vector space and the sort of result is what I'll call the Hux homology of the category C with respect to the end of functor F. So here F is an end of functor of C. Uh, compact object preserving, maybe. Uh, actually, I don't know. Okay. Um, what's, the, what's the CH? Um, CH is just chain complexes. Uh, chain okay. complexes is uh, the DG category. Yeah. Uh, okay. With quasi isomorphism converted. So uh, I guess maybe. So yeah, derived category derived everywhere. Okay. Um, so let me just sort of spell out a few properties of this construction. So uh, some properties. So the first is that this dual always exists, um, and it's unique in the best way possible, which is up to contractable homotopy. So, uh, so, uh, so IE, um, given any two dual, dualizing, uh, so if I pick two different duals, if I pick C1 dual and C2 dual, a priori, they can give rise to two different Hopf homologies, right? So they can give rise to something like that, or I'll just write, I'll just put some tips. Uh, and, and the claim is that there's a canonical quasi isomorphism between these two chain complexes up to uh, the second property is that this is derived Morita invariant. It's a localizing invariant. And in particular, what this means is that if I have a semi orthogonal decomposition, C, then uh, the Hofstra homology of C is a direct sum of the uh, Hofstra homology of the semi orthogonal subcategories. So this is this is useful in sort of actually for in doing computations. Um, and then the, the final thing is that we have a comparison map from K theory, the K theory spectrum to Hofstra homology. So these are not chain complexes. So the sort of crucial, the main observation is that we can leverage the first property here to sort of come up with two different models uh, for Hopf homology, which have to be sort of, which we can kind of treat as the same, same thing. So uh, the two models, so the two models I want to consider. So the first one is algebraic or, and this one uh, sort of, so for example, uh, if, uh, well, this is sort of computed with a cyclic bar complex, i.e. some sort of like categorical generalization of the, the, the bar complex one would use to compute the, the sort of this, 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 this tensor product. So, um, so here, uh, what we use is the fact that uh, C dual, we can always take C dual if C is uh, compactly generated to be the incompletion of the opposite. Uh, okay, so the second model is geometric. So in this case, um, my category C is going to be, okay, so let me just, for example, take C to be the category quasi coherent sheaves on some stack. Let me be a little bit blind about what conditions I want to put on the stack. So here now the perfect, ob the, the compact objects are the perfect complexes. And what we have is naive duality gives us an identification of the compact objects with its opposite category. So using this sort of sheaf, this using, so if we sort of somehow pass through this equivalence instead, this gives us some identification of C dual with C itself. Uh, i.e. quasi-coherent sheaves are self-dual. Uh, sort of write that out. So quasi-coherent sheaves on X are self-dual. Um, and also, uh, due to, we also have, have uh, that, 
equivalence between the sort of tensor product of these two categories with quasi coherent sheaf on the product. So altogether, um, what, so to sort of compute the Hopf homology now, what we have to do is identify the co-evaluation and the evaluation. So, so let me just sort of draw the diagram. So the, the, the co-evaluation is just going to be given by this composition, and the evaluation is going to be given by the pull push along this composition. So and then one feature of derived algebraic geometry is that if one can sort of always do base change. So we sort of do base change along the middle. And uh, so I'll just sort of define the, the derived loop space uh, to be the sort of base change of the self-intersection of the diagonal. So here, the derived loop space for derived F fixed points for F a self a proper self map. Uh, so I'll just define this to be the fiber product. Um, like so. And this fiber product has to be derived, but um, right, so so what happens when we do this means well. The composition of these two ends up being the composition over the top. So the sort of conclusion here is that the Hoxha homology of QCO X with respect to the, the push forward for F is just uh, global sections on the sort of loop space of X. And similarly, we have. Uh, or for there's sort of a renormalized version of QCO where the compact the compact objects are coherent sheaves, and for that category and for that category uh, we have instead um, uh, global volume forms on, on on the loop space. So why is this? So this this is this is the sort of sheafy realization I guess we were looking for, right? So somehow optional homology has a the realization is global sections of some sheet, right? So global sections of um, on some kind of weird loop space of this sheet. Um, okay, so maybe so the conclusion is that if uh, we take some map x to y and take z to be the self intersection, uh, sorry, the self fiber product, then the Hopsch homology, the category of coherent sheaves on z, is equivalent to global volume forms on the loop space of z. And this thing is equivalent to the self x by the same sort of uh, six functors formalism, where I guess there aren't six functors, but Math is proper, so it's okay. Uh, it's equivalent to self x of the push forward, the loops version of the push forward of the structure sheaf of the loop space of x. Okay, so um, I've said a whole bunch. So maybe before continuing, I should say a little bit about what this loop space is. So, I mean, if well, maybe I'll just make an observation here. Uh, if F is the identity and we don't take a derived fiber product, then this loop space is some derived version of the inertia stack of X, i.e. its points you can think about as equal to points of X plus uh, an automorphism. Of, uh, of, of x of the point. So um, let's just sort of work out what this is in an example, in maybe the example of interest. So for us, what we want to input into this is mu is the map from uh, the stacky Springer resolution 
to the stack you know cone cone. Or rather, maybe let me just uh, the stacky we alpha. So what happens when we do this? Uh, so we have the loop space of the Springer resolution. So let me not say too much about what that is. But over here, we have the loop space of the Lie algebra, which is exactly so if we sort of okay, so uh, so somehow you know, so uh, so this this thing you can compute it with the following fiber product uh, or rather sort of there's sort of a general formula for how to compute the loop space of a quotient stack. It's given by the fiber product. Where uh, sort of this map is the diagonal, and this one sends x g mapping to the projection and then the action. So if you sort of unwind this, what we get down here, we get uh, triples of elements. Okay, so we get an element of a Lie algebra, a group element, and then a, uh, a scalar such that. Um, G X G inverse equals group X. So this is exactly the sort of stack of unipotent lingualist parameters we sort of discussed earlier. Okay. Um, great. So the sort of conclusion of all this formalism is sort of uh, so once we sort once we sort of compute. Right. So. Uh, Once we compute the Hopsch homology of the mixed affine Pekka category, right? Uh, or rather, let's just sort of so a sort of uh, a consequence of, of this formalism is that we what we have is that modules for the, the Hopsch homology of the mixed affine Pekka category will naturally embed. Uh, well, okay, so it's equivalent to the essential image of. The sort of loop space of this uh, Springer of the sort of uh, loop space push forward of the structure sheep of loop space push Springer resolution. So this is a thing we'll call the coherent Springer sheep. So the coherent Springer sheep, and this embeds fully faithfully just by the same formalism into the category of coherent sheaves. On the unipotent Langlands parameters, right? So this is the result. This is the theorem modulo the calculation of the Hopsch homology of the mixed up category. So um, that calculation, it, well, so it turns out that this um, the growth in knee group. So this comparison map. Maps of the Hopsch homology. It also maps the truncation, and it turns out that uh, one can sort of just calculate using Roman's uh, sort of dual two dual realizations of the Affine Heck category. Uh, one can compute that um, somehow this map factors through k naught, and that this map is a nice morphism. Right. So in particular, since we knew that uh, this. Uh, algebra is the affine heck algebra uh, redundant, at least with the first statement in the theorem. So the first statement in the theorem is that we have this embedding. Okay, maybe in the remaining time, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, uh, categorical traces. Maybe I'll stop. Are there any questions? Uh, Okay, so in the remaining time, I'd like to sort of address the final two points of the theorem. So the first, well, rather maybe just just, just the, the, the the aspherical anti-spherical module um, statement. So parabolic induction is a little bit more uh, technical, uh, but somehow the question here is how do we identify the the sort of Whitaker object, Whitaker module? Or the anti-spherical module. 
So um, to do this, we sort of had to sort of, uh, we, so there's sort of um, a point I repressed, I suppressed earlier, which is that it's not immediately obvious why this isomorphism, this identification is one of, uh, is one of algebras. But this sort of follows automatically by some compatibility of categorical traces with Hoxha homology, which is which I think of as some kind of decategorified trace. So let me just sort of introduce a general setup. So let's take again mu a map from x to y. Let's take z to be the fiber self fiber product. Um, so attach. And the category I want to consider is the category of coherent sheaves on Z. So attached, so, and this is a monoidal category under convolution. So attached to a monoidal category, I can associate the two following things. So there's a, there's a, there's a vertical trace, which we've already discussed. And this is the, what I've denoted as Hochschild homology. Um, and then there's the horizontal trace. Um, so I'll denote this with a trace. And what this thing ends up being is it's incoherent sheaves with a certain singular support condition, which, which I'll sort of suppress on the loop space of the base Y. Uh, furthermore, um, uh, what one has, so, in both settings, there's a sort of notion of character. So given an object, so here, if I have an ob a sort of sheaf, if I have a sheaf in a sort of in the, in the compact category, one can associate to it an element of the Hopf homology, which we call its character. And similarly down here, if I have a module category, so if M is a A module category, where A is this category, one can associate to it a character which ends up being an object in, in this trace. And there's sort of a natural compatibility between, uh, so uh, let me just sort of state the following theorem, uh, which is due to Gatesbury, Kazan, Rosenblum, and Barshowski. Uh, and so somehow, so if we take HOM in the categorical trace of an algebra A from uh, the trace of the sort of regular representation into the trace of M, this is equivalent to the Hoch homology of M as, okay, yeah, it's equivalent to the decategorified Hoch homology of M. Furthermore, we have sort of an action here of HOM A A, uh, and this is equivalent to the Hoch homology of A. And this equivalence should be um, compatible with the actions on the two sides, i.e., since M is an A module category, the Hoch homology receives an A module, Hoch homology of A module structure. And over here, it'd be just sort of composed. Okay, so, uh, so the sort of way how this sort of gets us an identification of the Whitaker object is that. What we know is that the growth in D group of the category of coherent sheaves on the, on the Springer resolution is the sort of anti is the anti spherical model. This is a calculation that one can do, and one can sort of check. The same is true for Hochschild homology. So. Uh, all that remains is to sort of identify what happens when we take the trace, right? So what we have is that, right? So if we just sort of look on this side, what we know is that uh, somehow uh, right, we sort of identified, um, right, we've identified the sort of the, 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 the anti-spherical module as a decategorified object. And what we need to do is sort of, 
for compute what does the categorified what is character is in the categorified trace. So uh, so the way this goes is that uh, we have the following calculations. So we take the regular representation of A. Uh, its character is just the coherent Springer sheet, right? So it's this thing. We, we call them coherent Springer sheet. And um, on the other hand, if we take, so this, this is sort of the character of the regular representation. On the other hand, we can take the character of the standard represent, this sort of standard representation. And what this, thing's end up, what this thing ends up being is the local, the right local cohomology with respect to the image of F of the structure sheaf of the loop space of Y, the sort of base. Uh, so, um, so what this tells us is, okay, so corollary. So what we have, right, is that Hofstra homology of coherent sheaves on Z modules, right? So this is a fully, this embeds fully faithfully into, into the, the categorical trace with the essential image is just sort of, um, you know, the subcategory generated by the coherence sheet, right? Just by the same, by the same formalism, we, we have that this, the self, the, 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 the endomorphisms of, of of the character of A or just it's just Hofstra homology. Its right adjoint is the functor Hom out of A, uh, i.e., the coherent Springer sheet. Let's just write it. So if we knew, so if we knew that, um, so what we so 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 the conclusion here. So so, so what we know. Now is that if we take Hom from S to this local cohomology, we get um, the anti-spherical, right? But that doesn't necessarily imply that somehow uh, the anti-spherical. So what, what, what we want uh, is the sort of up the. the uh, okay, so we'll write it this way. What we know is that if we take, uh, okay, so if we take this local cohomology and we map it this way, we get anti spherical. And we, what we want is sort of the other, the other direction. So let me just sort of make a comment. Uh, so I'm just going to drop this, uh, this local cohomology thing. So this thing is irrelevant if mu, if uh, by f, sorry, if I meant mu. So this thing is irrelevant if mu is surjective. In our case, mu is not surjective, but you can we can kind of argue that I mean somehow it still works uh, if Q is not a root of unity. So, but it's like the the loops it's it's kind of close enough if Q is a root is not a root of unity. Um, so let me just sort of suppress that detail, but sort of um, to get the other direction, i.e., that the anti-spherical module here maps to the structure sheaf, what we need, what we need to show is that the anti-spherical is in the subcategory generated, sorry, that the structure sheaf is in the subcategory generated by this coherent Springer sheaf. And in fact, um, what's true is that it's a sum and. So um, O is a sum and of S, and this is sort of analogous to Usual Springer theory, the constant sheaf is a sum end of the Springer sheaf. Okay. Um, 
think that's roughly what I had prepared and there's not so much time left. So maybe I'll just stop here. Uh, are there any questions? All right, let's thank uh, Harrison. Any first, so any questions? Uh, so if, if you use your uh, strategy uh, to uh, like uh, uh, GON, uh, so that anything uh, special happen, if, for example, is that, uh, uh, okay, so we, we know local land in this case, so that everything is, uh, uh, yeah, so anything special here or uh, compatible with the classical method? Right, so this is something we're trying to sort of work out um, Right, so let me just sort of make a comment. So what, what we have, um, sort of, yeah, so let's say G equals GLN. Uh, maybe I'll make two, a, a quick remark. So for, the first remark is that in that case, so this is the part of the paper that I sort of know the least about, but um, David Holm would be the expert here. So um, there's some, I, I think he, there's some sort of, there's some sort of argument for sort of extending the unipotent, uh, what, what we can say, somehow we get an embedding of, uh, sorry, uh, it's been far too long since I like, thought about that part of the paper, <laughs> but um, th there's some statement that can be made for sort of all, I, I believe all uh, representations of the, piano, of, of the of, right? so in this case, I think we get some embedding of all representations of GF smooth into the coherent sheets on all Langlands parameters. Um, but I can't quite remember how it goes. The other statement is uh, if we just sort of look at the Deleen Langlands uh, sort of part. So if we just look at the sort of principal series, uh, one might ask. Is this thing an equivalence, right? So somehow, um, uh, right? Because uh, well, first, right? The, the L-packets are all trivial, so somehow there's no like weird component groups that could possibly show up. But uh, one, well, it, it, it's still not an equivalence. That's what I want to say. Somehow, it, it can't possibly be an equivalence because this thing has a compact generator. Right, but this thing, if G equals GL1, uh, what is it? It's just, um, uh, it, it's, it's uh, it, I think it's, it's just BT, BGL1. So, um, sorry, it's, it's BGL1 mod BGL1. So somehow uh, this thing doesn't have a compact generator has infinitely many compact generators given by characters of GL. So, so there, there's no possible way for this to be an equivalence. And uh, the sort of the difference, I mean, the expectation is that the, 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 diff, the failure of that thing to be an equivalence has to do with the different orbits that appear in this sort of categorical Wingland's uh, that's, that's sort of being studied by, uh, I guess, other people. I, I don't know too much about, about that, but that's sort of the okay. So any other questions? Is, is there um is there some expect so, so Emerton, Helm, and Moss, I think, uh, constructed some kind of um like hypothetical local language and families for GLN. Right. Um, is there some relation between the Iwahori invariance of uh, that representation and, I don't know, this, this picture, I don't know exactly what. Right, uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not super familiar with that. I, 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 I like, I know the paper, but I'm not familiar with it, so I'm I'm hesitant to say anything concrete. But uh, I mean, in some sense, 
uh, I mean, there's sort of a spiritual interpretation, I guess, of this result as a kind of local language of families, but I don't know about a precise relation, right? Like somehow, um, I mean, you can, you can sort of ponder families of, of represent, you, like somehow, I don't want to say, like somehow we, we, we sort of interpret the coherent Springer sheets as a sort of universal, uh, right? It, it, we, we, I mean, yeah, there's, there's somehow, I, I'd like to kind of interpret it as, as, as sort of a universal family of representations where sort of the fiber over a given parameter is the representation associated to that parameter. And I think there's a paper by, uh, by, um, by Eugen Hellman where he kind of works this out in the case in GL2 or SL2, um, sort of explicitly and sort of constructs uh, sort of a, a coherent Springer sheaf in that case explicitly that sort of has this property, but whether, I mean, we expect that it's the same as our coherent Springer sheaf, but we don't prove that or anything. Uh -huh. So you don't know if what he produces is the same thing that you guys produce? I mean, I think it almost certainly is, but uh, it's not something we like broke down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think he's he. OK, maybe he just conjectured that. I mean, I think he conjectured that there was um, some characterizing property in terms of parabolic induction. And, and I guess mm. you said that yours um, satisfies that. Right. So uh, I think we, we do, we prove that our picture satisfies the, the, the sort of um, properties in its conjecture, but I'm, I guess I don't know to what extent it's characterizing. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe, 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 maybe it's it's in there. All right. Any other questions? Okay, like Samson Harrison. Yeah. 